their production accounts only for the 30 percent of the global oil production okay so because of that i would want to start uh, with the whole world picture and then i will concentrate on the middle east uh, so more than the half of the world's proven resources are located in the Middle East, Canada and United States. Also, Latin America, Africa and Russia has certain amount regarding on that. So, the, uh, actually, uh, some of these resources are giant oil fields. Some of them uh, has uh, heavy oil. Uh, an important uh, part of these includes heavy oil in it. So uh, we will discuss these ones, how we can adapt these type of resources, the production uh, part to the renewable renewables uh, in a, a certain time, in the mid range of time and long term period. Okay. So, uh, of course, it is worth uh, to note that the regions which have a higher proven resource do not mean that they produce uh, proportionate to their proven proven resource sizes, okay? So we have to know this one. The fields with more than 1 billion barrels of recoverable oil are defined as super GM fields, and the fields with recoverable oil amounts ranging from five, uh, 500 million to uh, 5 billion barrels are called giant oil fields, okay? So the number of super giant fields in the world is around 40, 42, 40. So, the super giant, super giant fields have been discovered mostly in the Persian Gulf region of Arabian Iranian sedimentary basin, the United States, Mexico, Russia, Libya, Algeria, Brazil, and Venezuela, uh, these countries. So here, as you can see, the Arabian plate, uh, more than half of these uh, super giant oil fields are included in this region that you see in gray and uh, bold gray, okay? So, uh, although the definition of giant uh, fields may vary between experts, uh, but nearly uh, 3,000, around 3,000 giant, giant oil fields have been discovered globally. So the map of, the map of giant and supergiant oil and gas fields uh, of Europe, Russia, Central Asia uh, has been shown in these two figures, okay? The gray areas. Okay, so the major oil producers and consumers, as uh, you can see in the left table, uh, are United States, Saudi Arabia, Russia, Canada, China, Iraq, the sixth one, United Arab Emirates, Brazil, Iran, Kuwait, uh, and uh, total top on top ten, sorry, uh, includes seventy five percent of all. Okay, so the OPEC member countries hold nearly eighty percent of world's proven crude oil reserves. So there is a study regarding on this header at all in two thousand twenty. They presented a study about the total oil and gas reserves in the world and smart investments of exploration and production companies in renewable energy resources. The total oil in the world was reported in the range of 1.27 and 1.70 trillion barrels of uh, oil. Okay. So, and the total uh, total world's gas reserve was reported 7,490 around trillion cubic feet in the study. So, the present reserves are estimated to stand for 40 to 45 years by considering daily oil production which was 99.6 say 100 million barrels in 2008 it was okay so natural gas reserves are estimated to last for 50 to 55 years with current uh, forecasts current first forecasts okay okay so we said that uh, we, we gave uh, detailed information regarding on the reserves now we will talk about the conventional reserves and unconventional reserves so conventional reserve production was started, as uh, most of you know, was started by 1857 in Pennsylvania, which uh, the reserves were located at the depth with an easy access. So this is uh, this is a, a formal uh, date that has been given, but it is not true. The, the first oil production in the world started in Baku. Uh, maybe most of you know regarding on this. 
started in Baku in uh, 1846. Uh, okay, so uh, Baku is the first place. So we have to uh, correct this information. But in all, most of the sources, it's given as uh, 1857, uh, 59. Sorry, but not. So as the oil prices rise gradually, the investments aid, a, aim to uh, develop unconventional resources increased as well. Okay. As reaching conventional petroleum gets harder, the unconventional reserve term has been born in order to define the what accumulation way of oil and gas in the industry. So therefore, the new alternatives for oil and uh, natural gas production has been dispatched by uh, to, from 2000 to 2010s. Okay, started in this time. So. Uh, let's see uh, the types of the unconventional resources, as you can see in the figure. Oil sand, tight gas, uh, coal bed methane, the tight oil, shale gas, shale oil and gas hybrids. So uh, when we go from the top to the down to the pyramid, the technology has to be increased for uh, production, for an extra production from these resources. So if you, if your technology is increasing, the technology that you are using has to be increased. If it is increasing, so the price also will be increased. We are, that's what we are expecting all the time. OK, so. Mainly the accumulations of the unconventional reserves are also vast in size and lower in profitability. That's the result of this increasing price of the technology requirement. So it is required to have advanced technology solutions in order to each unconventional reserve, right? So nowadays, the most active uh, place where uh, unconventional oil and gas resources are in place is North America, of course, but uh, in various places in Earth, so it starts to find new resources and uh, start to make some, some drillings on these, right? So, uh, as we mentioned from uh, with uh, our pyramid, so I will pass this slide and slowly we are shaping our uh, our um, portion of view with these slides. Okay, so the hydrocarbon distribution in the world and continue. So this, uh, according to there is a study uh, with Mohammed Hamid and Amar Musin, uh, dated in 2015. The shale of existing countries uh, and their resources are given in, in, in terms of billion barrels I, uh, are given, as you can see in the table. So when I go through to the percentage, so we can say that North America has the, the, the uh, most share uh, with 19%, and Western Europe 5%, Latin America uh, 17%, and so on. It goes like this, okay? So, in terms of crude oil, as you can see, uh, the OPEC uh, countries and non-OPEC countries resources, and uh, it's around 80% in OPEC countries, and for non-OPEC countries, about around 20%, uh, you can say. And when we check this OPEC count, uh, when we check the whole, actually, we can see, we can say that, uh, is there any connection problem? No, teacher, everything is okay. We can hear you. Okay, so you can see my screen? No, 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 no. no. Screen. no. Okay. Can we? Sorry. Okay. Wait, now, because of the connection, I think this is the problem. So we will handle that, no worries. Okay. Now I think you can so see, right? It's okay, it's okay now. Yes, yes, we can okay. see. If you if we lose the connection like this, so please uh, let me know about that, okay? Thank you. So I continue. So we said that 80% uh, is belong to OPEC countries and 20% around non-OPEC countries. Okay. So the proven crude oil reserves also given 
as you can see here with the, with the numbers. OK. OK. So this is uh, this uh, we I got from OPEC and News Bulletin in 19, uh, 2019. So another information. The top 10 gas producing countries in the world. Uh, you can see in the uh, figure as well. So again, United States and Russia uh, are in the top and then Iran follows them with Qatar and Canada, uh, the first five. OK, so US has the largest US is the largest gas producer with uh, around uh, 766 million uh, billion, sorry, meter cubic meter uh, annual production. So uh, Russia is the second one, which is very close, 600, uh, 635 billion meter cubic, uh, cubic meter per year. So uh, it goes uh, so on. OK, so. In terms of heavy oil, OK, in terms of heavy oil, heavy oil can be used internationally to describe what the oil with high viscosity, OK, the oil with high viscosity. So there are some uh, friends I can see here from chemical engineering. So let me give uh, this kind of introduction and we will go on. All right. So heavy oil generally contains a lower proportion of volatile constituents and larger proportion with high molecular weight constituents as compared to conventional crude oil. All right. So often referred as to as light oil, uh, we shall describe the characteristics of the types of oil further uh, we further uh, uh, later on. Okay, so the heavy oil just doesn't contain a composition of paraffins and the asphaltins, but also contains higher traces of wax and resins in its composition. So these components have larger molecular structure, leading to high melting and poor points. So this makes the oil a bad candidate for flow profiles and adversely affects the mobility of uh, the hydrocarbon in total. If you include a heavy oil, so the mobility will be lower and lower compared with the conventional, co not conventional, compared with the crude oil, light oil, uh, condensate, okay, this type of oils. It will be very hard to move it, all right? So it's important to know the constitution of heavy oil as it affects first the recovery with its low viscosity and high melting points, the processing, higher resins, sulfur and aromatic contents. All right. So the transportation, because it has a low viscosity again. OK, so heavy and extra heavy oil account found predominantly where in Venezuela, Canada, Russia, uh, in some offshore fields of Brazil, Alaska and China. All right. Uh, account for 70 percent of worse oil and its production is expected to increase to uh, 18 uh, billion uh, barrel per day by 2035, right? So it has a very huge potential. It has a very huge potential in future. So we, it's, it's a certainly, it's certain that with this uh, current condition of the earth, with this uh, global warming, etc. So we have to adapt the renewables exactly to this source of oil, all right? So, due to the challenge involved in extracting it economically while lowering the environmental impacts, this increase is going to depend on the technological developments, of course. So, environmental impacts include water and air pollution, as I told you, the uh, climate change and the global warming, public uh, health effects, noise and light pollution, of course, can be included. So, increased seismic activity, via injection wells, increasing greenhouse gas emissions and deforestation, of course. All right. So we have to take care of all these issues when we are producing oil or our oil and gas. Because why? Because uh, we have to accept this, that oil and gas, oil and gas has to be in our world uh, in certain amount of time, maybe 100, 200 years more. We have to face this one. We have to uh, we have to use oil and gas. There is no other option, right? So, but we have to make this green as green as possible that we can do. All right. So we will search about the ways of these. All right. Okay. So, 
since the bitumen is uh, very viscous and cannot flow uh, as we mentioned heavy oil so bitumen is heavier than the uh, heavy oil so it cannot flow and cannot be pumped without being diluted or heated or other things so oil sands cannot be produced with the conventional methods so according to the depth of these oil sands surface mining and in situ drilling techniques can be used for extraction. There are some uh, some uh, examples of these for surface mining, for example, in Canada, for tar sands, they are doing this uh, and successfully doing this. So these are the techniques that we are concentrating, alternative techniques, okay? So surface mining is applied to reservoirs basically less than 70 meters below the surface. So otherwise, removal, removal of too much of a burden would make the process uneconomical and less environment. So open pit mining has a more negative environmental impact than oils, a combination of clay, bitumen and chemicals that are left as mud in open surface pumps are a potential air and water pollution risk. I got this part from the Gossel et al. and Frank et al. Uh, works, uh, which has been done in 2010 and 2014. So, we are mentioning these ones all the time in our work, in our studies, in our research, right? So, okay, we are mentioning, but we have to make it, we have to put it to action from the potential. We have to bring all the things to kinetic energy, okay? And we have to get the precautions, necessary precautions that we can do uh, as soon as possible about this, all right? So, okay. So, University of Calgary, in associate with the uh, Carnegie uh, Endowments Energy and the Climate Program, analyzes uh, GHG emissions, uh, which greenhouse gases, which means emissions during the oil extraction, transportation, refining, marketing, and combustion, and have noted that heavy oils released almost twice as much greenhouse gases compared to the lighter ones. Okay. So the first thing that we have to we have to be careful and we have to get precautions is the heavy oil producing fields. All right, heavy oil producing fields. So here the figure shows the estimated uh, greenhouse gases emissions from uh, one barrel of oil generated annually from spe specific heavy and extra heavy oil fields all over the world. All right. So it's a kind of comparison that has been given according to the countries. So it also illustrates how upstream, midstream, and downstream decisions alter the greenhouse gas emissions. All right. So here, another thing that we are always mentioning about the average global temperature and the forecast and expectations about this one, I would like to mention. So the average global temperature are projected to increase by 5% by 2100. OK, so nearly in eight years, within eight years, we are expecting 5% increase uh, uh, per estimates, actually, from the global carbon projects and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate, climate Change. All right. So the greenhouse gases absorb and re radiate the sun's infrared waves that leads to an increase in the amount of the heat on the surface on the surface of earth and cause global warming so the global warming potential depends on the gas molecules radiated forcing and its atmos atmospheric lifetime which is the residence, residence time in the atmosphere okay so gases such as methane carbon dioxide uh, hydrogen sulfur uh, and two all, okay, are the uh, emissions from energy industry and have high, of course, uh, GWP in here that we can see, okay. So, and affects the global warming uh, in a, in a uh, strict levels. So, methane has a strong, strong impact on greenhouse effect and its atmospheric lifetime, okay. Its atmospheric lifetime is around 12 uh, plus minus 3 years, we can say, 12 years, while CO2 has less impact, but longer atmospheric lifetime changing between 30 to 95 years. So if you release your CO2 to the atmosphere, the maximum amount 
probably you will see it. If, let's say average 50 years later, same CO2 molecule will be in the atmosphere. Okay, so it is a very huge impact. All right. So in the 20 year level that we can see G, uh, GWP of methane is 72 times of CO2. As a result, methane has to be considered as a priority for greenhouse gases control. And the CO2 is the second part. OK, CO2 is the second part. So the estimated projections present that the global warming seems to reach 1.5 centigrade by 2000 increase I'm talking about 1.5 centigrade by 2055 if it continues to rise at current rates all right at current rate so moreover what we can say according to the evidence an additional 0.5 centigrade will cause a sharp growth in extreme temperatures increase in the intensity of the precipitations and drought in different regions and in addition to this there will be a severe impact on the ecosystem, the whole ecosystem of Earth, and many species may face extinction. Also, warmer temperatures, temperatures will increase the temperature of oceans. This will affect the fisheries and ecosystem of the ocean directly. All right. So now it's not still too late, but we have to get our precautions as soon as possible. Okay. So another figure in here, it illustrates the projected increase in global mean temperature relative to the pre-industrial time period between 1850 to uh, 19, all right, 19,000. So for seven different atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases uh, that we are expecting to get in the year of 2000-2100. Okay, so as I already explained, the greenhouse gases, mainly methane and carbon dioxide, adversely affect the climate, but also high concentrations have negative air quality impact in confined places as well. So these air pollutants can cause an increase in some health problems, mainly heart and lung uh, diseases in people and animals, cancers and strokes. Okay according to the World uh, Health Organization. They are, they are saying this directly. So additional, let's go to back, uh, go back to our, uh, our topic. Additionally, what we can say, heavy oils can be classified as per their sulfur content. So high sulfur content crude oil that have over 1%, more than 1% sulfur with aromatics and asphaltines, asphaltines can cause further deterioration of environment directly. So high sulfur, high sulfur crude oil has mostly found where, which countries first two we mentioned, Canada, California in US, Mexico, Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia, all right? So these are the, these are the countries that you have to, we have to get the precautions in first case, first case immediately. So. The sulfur is transformed in the sulfur dioxide, SO2, during the refinery process of oil, right? So, sulfur dioxide and other byproduct nitrogen oxides also emitted into the atmosphere uh, and forms acid rains. So that can cause also harmful effects on soil and forests by damaging trees and weaken forest ecosystems and on streams and lakes by increasing the acidity of water and treating fish and other aquatic organisms like right okay so here you are you can see some environmental impacts clearly this is uh, this is uh, a map from the Canada's tar sand region uh, so as you can see uh, the differentiation these the red ones uh, the three losses shows the three losses compared with 2000 and 2012. So all these areas, this is the uh, oil field, all right, oil field zone, and all these areas, uh, the forest has been gone, all right, cut. Okay, so another satellite image from Canadian tar sands mining area. You can see what type of harmful uh, project it is. So, 
So we have to change these projects also uh, to make them much more environmental. This is a necessity actually, right? So. Another uh, region from Canada, uh, Alberta, uh, well sites. So uh, here you can see uh, mining area damage also can be seen from the figure. OK, the areas can be seen from the, from the figure directly. OK, so the individual well sites here are relatively small, which gives the impression that the footprint of the oil and gas industry is less. OK. So on the other hand, about 400,000 well sites are developed just in Alberta region of Canada. So therefore, the possibility remains that larger areas of forest are destroyed, are destroyed by insecure recovery of heavy oils than the surface mining. So as a result, the future of our environmental environment and heavy oil extraction depends on future technological developments. Another study that I am giving to you. All right. So. Now, I want to talk about the processes uh, regarding on the hydrocarbon recovery. All right. So because this has to be our first concentration point as if we make this part clean, so we will cover more than 30 percent uh, release of these greenhouse gases through to the atmosphere, which is coming from oil and gas industry. So making EOR processes clean and environmental is the crucial part of this uh, adaptation of renewables to oil and gas industry team, right? So EOR processes for hydrocarbons I will mention and I will uh, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow in this uh, tomorrow session, I will mention about what type of uh, project has been done in terms of solar, wind, uh, geothermal, whatever, to make these processes greener, all right? So I will start with the cyclic solvent in injection, uh, CSI, all right? So this CSI is a cyclic process uh, which conducts uh, within a single well where the injected is uh, solvent, all right? Generally, the solvent consists of light hydrocarbons blue gases and mixed or unmixed form of carbon dioxide, right? So the working principle of CSI is based on, uh, is based on the disintegration of the solvent via molecular diffusion within the heavy oil, right? So uh, as a result of this, you can get some part, some more part of your heavy oil through to the surface, okay? So here in, the heavy oil zone is governed by the dissolved gas oil flow and free gas flow for the solvent chamber. All right. As you can see from in the, in the, in the picture, the process, the total process. All right. So the flow pattern in the solvent chamber depends on the transverse gradients in the gas zone during the injection and production phases. So in the injection phase, the injected free gas moves throughout the solvent chamber as well as the vestigial foamy oil, okay? So in the production phase, the solvent-rich heavy oil produces foamy oil that release free gas from the solvent chamber. So that gas oil flow contributes to the typical features of the solvent chamber, such as volume and geometry, uh, since the solvent chamber behaves as a, uh, as a porous storage medium that controls the free gas volume and forms the flow pattern which directly affects the relative quantity of fluids and flow resistance respectively, right? Okay, so, so particularly in, uh, in uh, cyclic solvent injection, the free gas, the free gas is provided from an outer source all the time. So hence, the combination of flows of this free gas and foamy oil exists in a very early stage when the institute pressure is greater than the set of bubble point pressure of oil. So co consequently, what we can say, the amount of free gas corresponds to the quantity added to the continuous gas, which is formed by the soft gas bubbles. Therefore, 
the gas oil flow in CSI is different from that in solution gas drying mechanism for heavy oil in terms of what time, quantity, and behavior. Okay. All right. So. Let's talk a little bit about the economics, uh, the HEC, uh, health and safety, and the environmental considerations of this cyclic solvent injection. So CSI is an overall process, including the CO2 purchase, the transportation, the recycling, sequestration, and the oil production. Okay. So apart from the economical profit gained from the increased oil production, CO2 injection can also be used for carbon capture and storage by secluding, secluding carbon dioxide geologically in reservoir pore space. Okay, so in 2010s, I remember that in the Permian Basin, oil produced via CO2 injection is about um, mainly 5% of the cumulative uh, US oil production. Okay, so according to uh, according to another another uh, source, uh, Natal, Natal, uh, there are about uh, 126 billion barrels of crude oil can be technically recoverable by this recovery technique. Right. So, hence CO2 prices take an important place in the overall CSI process. In cost wise, I am talking about economically. So, a forecast on the CO2 prices. Uh, has to be done, has to be done uh, in a certain way. Uh, also, uh, this has to be uh, counted to the overall prediction of the costs, future costs. Okay. So furthermore, several studies conducted in uh, health and safety and environmental uh, aspects of CO2, uh, you are with CO2 actually, in terms of economic optimization geological storage, greenhouse gas emissions based on reservoirs as well, right? And the emissions factors. So the studies, uh, there are some research studies, if you're interested, I can give this one later on to you, to all of you. Studies show the integration of the CSI process with HEC and uh, CSS, also carbon dioxide injection. So let me talk a little bit uh, as the bottom lines about the CSI process. As a conclusion, we can say that the CSI process has been tested in the field with different case scenarios, uh, with indicating, the, uh, indicating a remarkable increment of oil production. In this manner, we can say that uh, CSI or uh, half and puff, they are calling half and puff process, solvent half and, half and puff, they call is accepted as one of the most efficient and practical recovery methods applied to conventional oil reservoirs as well as granting CSS opportunities. All right, so they are profitable if they apply it in correct order uh, operationally. Uh, they are profitable uh, and recoverable uh, processes. Okay, so another one, the Wapex, the vapor extraction. So the Wapex process uh, scheme also has been given in here, all right? This is a heavy oil recovery technique, another technique, by injecting solvents in vaporized form, okay? Through a horizontal line. So your well has to be horizontal and your fluid has to be in vaporized form, all right? For this uh, method. So the solvents diffuse into the immensely viscous viscous hydrocarbons and degrade the viscosity in order to what make the reservoir conveniently producible all right so vapex vapex was first introduced uh, in as uh, i want to say the correct time maybe in uh, 1990 or 1991 uh, butler uh, and their friends okay butler and their friends by studying what uh, a reservoir model including hot water and propane in laboratory scale. Of course, it was a laboratory work, a laboratory scale, where the oil recovery was beyond that with the usage of hot water only, as explained. So in, uh, in the consecutive study, uh, herein, I would like to mention that the oil recovery 
is uh, but still still greater by using the propane only, all right, which is almost at D point under reservoir conditions in, in the study uh, of uh, Butler et al. The first case. So in the light of these outcomes, Vapex seems more suitable for heavy oil and bitumen type uh, oil production, all right, uh, recovery actually, with less energy loss rather than those in the conventional techniques. So considering that uh, advancement, uh, Vapex proce process is advanced to the operated in pilot projects with uh, commercial viability. Right. So the development of uh, Vapex is uh, triggered via several influences, such as increasing the demand for energy, decreasing the light oil reserves, the operational benefits of Vapex, and the existence, existence of the heavy oil and bitumen resources, right? So, what can I say? The fact of the supplement of 10% of U.S. oil consumption from Canada, uh, Canada heavy oil and bitumen resources, and the depletion of conventional oil resource, uh, resources induced uh, the development of an effective heavy oil and bitumen recovery technology, such as vap Vapex, this uh, can be increased much more. All right. So, in Vapex, in order to decrease the viscosity of heavy oil, the solvent gases are used, sorry, in pure or mixed form. Okay, it can be used in pure form or it can be mixed for some other uh, chemical materials. So, some of the shortcomings of a single uh, well chemical injection models, such as CSI, as I mentioned previously, are stated by Butler again. They, they gave this one as well, a slow diffusivity and low recovery improvements. So hence, to improve the asphalting and recovery factors, a new model where hydrocarbon solvents in the vaporized form are injected through a horizontal well is developed and called as Vapex. So horizontal well in this method is a must. Okay, horizontal well is a must. Uh, because of the structure of the vapor that you inject, okay, gas form. Okay, so when we are concentrating on the uh, adaptation of renewables, we we have we can use this method uh, definitely uh, when we are making the vaporization in here. So in the in the uh, upper part in the surface we are using you know heaters. So these heaters directly can be converted to the renewable energy related sources and you can uh, heat your solvent and you can get your vaporized form uh, by using uh, renewable sources directly okay so we will talk tomorrow about this okay so recovery and production mechanisms of vapex so the basics of vapex mechanism depends on the degrading of viscosity by solvent absorption. Okay, so generally, Vapex is processed through horizontal wells where the injection injector is above the producer within a heavy oil and bitumen reservoir. So a solvent is vaporized or mixed form is injected at a pressure of nearly or equal to the saturation point. Okay. A simple uh, scheme of the Vapex process is given in the figure. So we already discussed this. All right. Okay. So what about the recovery and the production mechanisms of Vapex? So, so it shows the general Vapex mechanism actually here. So after the injection, the diffusion and the absorption of the solvent are proliferated in the vapor chamber within the reservoir, okay? So this process causes both decrease in the oil viscosity and asphalting contents. We call it what? The asphalting, right? So molecular diffusion and the surface tension enhance the mixing of solvent constitute in the mixing zone encircling the vapor, as you can see in the picture. So additionally, gas dissolution in heavy oil and bitumen improves recovery by creating a displacer front by expanding the oil in the pore spaces and weakening the adhesive forces acting among 
the oil droplets and the coordinate water. So correspondingly, what happens? The mobility of heavy oil and the bitumen increases by time, which helps the hydrocarbon flow towards to the producer uh, via gravity. The mechanism concept of Bapex is illustrated in the figure as you can see here. Okay. So Bapex actually has some advantages. Uh, the main one that we can consider uh, being a low capital expenses. Expenses are very low. So compared to the steam generation and wastewater treatment, injection doesn't uh, doesn't uh, need large scale surface facilities. Characteristics energy losses in the thermal recovery do not occur in the solvent injection. Okay. Uh, solvents in the vaporized form not only provides not only provides a more powerful thrust mechanism, but also conveniently recoverable. Ninety percent of solvents uh, averaged can be recovered back. Okay. So and uh, only what we can say to two three percent uh, maybe uh, of the energy expanded in. Uh, there is another method uh, called uh, steam acid gravity drainage. So uh, only 3% of the energy expanding the uh, steam acid gravity energy drainage in consumed in the Vapex process is consumed in the Vapex process. So Vapex tends to decrease greenhouse gas emissions up to 80% by the scope of the CO2 desolation uh, for maintaining uh, the pressure in depleted reservoirs. So another thing, uh, since Vapex works at a pressure of nearly or equal to the saturation point we are seeing, we mentioned, the asphaltation occurs, which causes the minimization of the constituent, uh, sorry, consequent upgrading of heavy oil and bitumen. Okay, so it's very advantageous process and has a huge potential to, to make it uh, green by using uh, the heaters uh, from the from the uh, renewable energy uh, by using renewable energy resources. Okay. So generally, I would like to mention a little bit about the summary of uh, costs, uh, as you can see here, for heavy oil and bitumen recovery techniques. Okay, here, for example, cold production. Cold production. There are some examples and. Uh, these examples gives you the operating cost and supply cost. These are real field results, by the way. Okay, so for, from Wawaska seal, it has been taken. The cold production has been applied uh, for a bitumen type crude oil. So the operating cost is given uh, nearly six to nine, and supply cost uh, fourteen to eighteen, for example. Okay, so when we come here, we can see that uh, CSS, the cyclic steam stimulation, and this SAGD, as I mentioned, steam as gravity drainage. Uh, has uh, average costs, and the uh, highest cost here is the integrated mining and upgrading uh, for synthetic crude that has been applied in here. The operating cost is uh, 18 to 22, when the supply cost reaches to uh, 36 to 40. So when we compare this, with this conventional technique, uh, we can say uh, the other techniques, UR techniques, can be uh, better in terms of costs as well, all right? Mining also here, it's a uh, low cost compared to others, but it's very conventional method, it has been applied and has some disadvantages as well. So, here mainly I give you the supply costs, including all costs related to production, OPEC, OPEX, uh, CAPEX, okay, taxes and uh, rate of return for several heavy recovery techniques uh, has been given, all right? So here, what I can say another thing for the for uh, when I compare these ones with the Vapex, uh, Vapex uh, supply cost of Vapex is natural gas price sensitive. Okay, so there is no need for surface facilities to generate the steam and process or recycle water. Also, the operating temperature is nearly uh, near reservoir temperature. It may have zero energy loss. Okay. Uh, so, uh, in this term, uh, the CAPEX and uh, OPEX for VAPEX process are 75 and 50 percent of those for SAGD, respectively. All right. So, that's what I can say. 
Another form of vapex is called heated vapor extraction. So this is the main form actually that I mentioned. Here you have to uh, give a uh, uh, give a heat uh, to your to your uh, fluid, uh, and we call it heat, heated uh, vapex. So this is a hybrid method actually, where superheated vapor is used as a solvent. Um, in heated vapex, this uh, actually superheated vapor brings further uh, heat energy into the system that has solvent to condensate at the interface and result in extra mining. Okay, so injecting heat as well as solvent uh, through the reservoir tends to increase the oil drainage rate. So the main concern in this heated VPEX, heated VPEX, is the is to adjust the optimal injection temperature to make the whole process economical. So there is an optimization needed in here, and you have to heat, you have to heat your uh, your fluid to reach to reach to a vaporized form. Uh, again, as I said, uh, when when if we use a renewable resource in this uh, part. Uh, this will uh, make this uh, operation much, much more green, right? So, environment. So, a comparison of the recovery factors, as you can see in the figure, the recovery factors by time has been given for uh, heated vapex with different temperatures in here, all right? With different temperatures in here. So, in first case here, uh, it's the temperature is 22 degrees. Uh, the pressure, uh, constant pressure, uh, all the time in four four cases, all four cases, and when we can reach to 60 degrees, the, the recovery factor comes to 70 persons by uh, 60 hours uh, time. Right. So let me give you a little bit about the bottom lines of this vapex. Several researchers actually stated in the same manner as vapex is an encouraging green heavy oil recovery technology. So there are some pilot projects and field studies show that the VAPEX is an efficient, competitive, economic and feasible. However, the advanced research still needed to optimize the operational aspects in a commercial point of view. OK, so. Uh, we already mentioned a little bit in the uh, last table but now we, I will give the details. The cyclic steam stimulation. This is the uh, one of the most commonly used uh, thermal uh, EOR recovery methods uh, that has been uh, called as the cyclic steam stimulation (CSS). Also, cyclic steam injection or half and puff or steam soap. All these names are used. Uh, in, in, in uh, recent decades related to this, all right? So, herein it's considered as an alternative way of steam injection, steam injection, that oil is recovered through the same wells by means of a steam condensation process containing two principal stages, which steam is injected during a couple of weeks in the first phase, and then heavy oil production is taking place by the same well, same well, through an injection process with a reverse flow R performed. Okay, so after these applications, after these applications, another steam reinjection is applied to the reservoir to initiate a cyclic process when the production rate of oil goes down below the critical threshold to value caused by the effect of the reservoir cooling. So CSS is usually based on steam injection and heavy oil recovery along with the condensate of steam through mostly a vertical well. So the injection pressure of the steam is practically larger than the fracturing pressure of the formation. And the soaking period is to follow, to follow this process after the oil recovery begins. So, so. <clears throat> the injected steam not only heats up to the heavy oil, but also reduces its viscosity by creating what? A heated zone and by making heavy oil flow back from the formation into the same well. Okay, so this is the working mechanism. So a typical CSS process, typical CSS process consists of three different states. Okay, so in the first phase, 
An injection is applied to the pay zone at a high pressure and temperature conditions at a certain time up to up to one month, not more than one month, up to one month. All right. So in the second phase, in the second phase, a soaking period that may usually carry on uh, one week or two weeks, one week or two weeks. That is the time required to diffuse the heat into the reservoir and to reduce the viscosity of heavy oil follows the injection period. OK, so you can see in the picture. You can see this in the figure directly. OK. Uh, in the last phase, in the last phase, uh, the third phase, the hay oil uh, is recovered by means of some artificial techniques, such as artificial lift can be, all right? So until what? Until, until when the production rates decrease to unreasonable levels that may take up to one year in terms of the feasibility of the well. This cyclic process can be repeated up to 15 times depending on the productivity. Productivity means feasible recovery rates. So that can be obtained from the wells. All right. So this is the uh, working mechanism of this cyclic steam injection, cyclic steam stimulation. Actually. Okay. So again, there is a need uh, to vaporize and heat. So again, we can use renewable energy in the heating section, in the heating section. And when you are making an artificial lift, in the second one, when you are making an artificial lift, you can use renewable energy resources to generate the electricity, and directly you can adapt this one to your artificial lifting, to your lifting techniques. You can use an ESP pump as well, right? So we will discuss this. Okay. All right. So. Here, the reservoir characteristics for a successful CSS project. OK, so I have a CSS project. I want it to be successful, so I have to care about some crucial points. First of all, the minimum depth for an application of an ideal CSS process, which is mostly utilized for the recovery of hay oil reservoirs, that's capable to inclusion of steam having high pressure about 1,000 feet. Uh, that relies on the characteristics of overburden formation that should not have the potential to be fractured. Okay, so the minimum depth is about 1,000 feet direct. Okay, so the best conditions related to the pay zone for the applications of a CSS process are relatively thicker formations having a thickness greater than meter and sand formations with high porosity larger than 30%. OK, so your thickness has to be greater than the 10 meter reservoir thickness, reservoir thickness. And the sand formation with high porosity, the porosity has to be higher than 30 percent. So the presence of shale barrier. In the presence of shale barrier causing decrease in vertical permeability. Is not be regarded as a major issue for vertical wells if the pay zones pass through Arctic. All right. So you have to be careful about these uh, parts. OK, so on the other hand, reservoirs with high horizontal permeability, such as 1000 mil Darcy, 1 Darcy minimum, all right, are crucial for heavy oil recovery. So furthermore, in recent years, vast having multilateral horizontal legs has started to be used in CSS applications because well, why? Because it's uh, these wells in the horizontal section with long leg, okay? Uh, even you have a lower permeability values because of the length of your uh, horizontal section, uh, it has a tendency to produce more, okay? Because of the area, produce production area, you have a tendency to produce more oil, so your recovery increases, okay? So the most encountered formations to which CSS is applied are tar sands and heavy oil reservoirs, of course. Okay. So there are some, of course, advantages and disadvantages of these techniques. Uh, these techniques, cyclic steam stimulation. Um, this actually, what I can say, this uh, can be this method can be considered as a pioneering method for steam drive technique, actually. Okay. So which is uh, which is not. Uh, efficient to satisfy the required steam injection rates to make uh, viscous heavy oil flow among the wells. So 
CSS can increase the applicability of steam dry technology by performing by performing repeated cycles of and up, remember, that cause the reduction of the flow resistance in a heavy oil reservoir that is one of the main advantages of the process. But conversely, on the most important limitations of CSS is much lower ultimate recovery obtainable uh, compared compared to the um, Compared to the for uh, compared to that from the steam dryer, so main drawback of this method that recovery factor provided is lower than 30 percent. Generally, actually lower than 20 percent of the original oil in place. However, a CSS process process uh, combines with a, a subsequent uh, steam dry operation can be a very efficient implementation, making heavy oil recovery much more faster and higher as well, okay? So, uh, let me give the bottom lines of this uh, cyclic steam stimulation method. It can be evaluated as an effective thermal method for heavy oil recovery by providing a higher amount of oil production. However, it has usually uh, relatively lower recovery rates, uh, around maximum 40%. Uh, uh, between 10 to 10 percent to 40 percent than the other thermal methods such as what steam flooding uh, that you can get 50 to 60 percent of original oil in place so uh, steam assisted gravity drainage that you can get 60 to 70 percent of original oil in place and in situ combustion using uh, Thai capri methods I will mention later on uh, they can get 70 to 80 percent of original oil in place okay so uh, when compared with these ones, relatively lower recovery rates you can get with this method. Okay. On the other hand, it can be considered as a cost-effective method compared to the other ones uh, and to be suitable technique, particularly when it's application to some types of reservoirs such as the, what have thinner, thinner interbedded formations which are not good match for some other methods like steam acid gravity range, all right, so in thickness. So uh, to sum up, CSS has uh, these three benefits as follows, even true, it does not provide high recovery factors as, as much as uh, other thermal motor methods like uh, steam assisted gravity range, right? So, uh, the, the, the bullet point of this method, what we can say first, using only one well with CSS process uh, is sufficient to decrease the main cost, such as capital investment, we can say. Another thing, it is scientifically and technically proven method. It can be applied for, for uh, thin bed zones, okay? It's a very useful technology, as I mentioned, that can be applied. Uh, to the places that other uh, UR recovery methods cannot be applied. Okay, so uh, cyclic steam stimulation also finalized. Let me pass through to the steam drive, steam pool flowing, uh, steam pool floating part. So this is one of the oldest thermal UR techniques actually, all right? It can call steam injection as well. Uh, and uh, it has been feasibly applied to heavy oil reservoirs since the beginnings of the 1960s, a very old methodology. So the main difference of this method compared to the hot water injection is that the gas phase enables to carry the vol volatile and light components of oil in the gas phase, in the gas phase, along with the steam and then condensed vapor, which causes the displacement process and sweep efficiency to be more attractive and improved can not only transport the hydrocarbons condensable, but also decrease the oil viscosity at the condensation front. So for this reason, the obtainable recovery from the steam drive, the steam drive is uh, much uh, more higher, actually much higher than that from the hot water drive. So steam drive, steam drive injection technique takes place into two main stage uh, as uh, steam stimulation of the producers, we can say, and the steam injection for the steam drive to enhance the recovery from other wells. Okay, from other wells. So, 
uh, cyclic steam stimulation is the method high uh, is the method with high quality steam uh, injected into your reservoir by means of a production well by applying certain amount of heat and surprisingly surpasses a steam dry process if any natural energy is available in the reservoir so steam flooding so steam flooding or steam dry we call uh, this process performed from an injection well into the reservoir and resulting heavy oil recovery and production of steam condensate from a producer constitutes the basis of the steam drive technique which generally follows a CSS application. So a, a good effective permeability is a necessity for a successful dry, uh, steam drive operation, definitely, because it provides to reach the required heat for the movement of the heavy oil by satisfying the appropriate injection rate of steam. Okay. So it is possible to encounter two naturally occurring issues which are plugging of reservoir and steam override in a steam drive operation. Migration of steam actually towards the higher parts of the lit zone may be created by any in-situ thermal, thermal phenomenon caused by density differences between hotter and cooler fluids, all right? So dealing with such kind of problems can be made by performing quick steam injection to a certain degree towards the bottom part of the relevant interval or the water or a fracture zone. So all those applications increase the reservoir temperature by mainly conduction mechanism, partially by convection, but mainly con conduction definitely because there's a, there's a flow and uh convection is limited in here and eventually uh, the efficiency of the subsequent steam injection operations applied to the aim zone can be enhanced so steam dry methodology can be improved by utilizing some solvents along with the steam to be able to decrease the interfacial tension for the enhancement of heavy oil recovery okay so the typical recovery factors for steam flooding or steam dry process are generally within 50 to 60 percent of original oil in place. However, higher recovery factors up to 70 percent can can also be observed in some oil reservoirs around the world. Uh, it's recorded, as it's indicated for some portions of the uh, in Indone Indonesia there was a field dury field. Uh, some portions reached to 70 70 percent recovery so the main limitation of this technique is to be costly and problematic if the amount of heat loss is substantial we, again we are coming to the heat loss okay so heat loss amount of heat loss is substantial so you have to prevent the uh, heat loss so moreover this uh, this approach requires a certain amount of steam having a remarkable energy content costing high expensive for an operation like the other thermal EOR methods that make use of steam, okay? So, again, we come to the heat loss problem. So, heat loss problem, you have to maintain uh, your heat uh, starting from the surface through to the lower parts. So, renewable energy can be a good alternative way to uh, supply and maintain your heat in a certain level. Okay, so we will discuss this one. Okay, so there are some uh, typical reservoir characteristics required to be met uh, for a successful steel drive operation, and it can be given uh, as the minimum reservoir porosity should be 20% according to the uh, research and studies. Uh, these uh, these uh, values has been taken, limitations. Minimum reservoir permeability should be 100 milli Darcy, 0.1 Darcy. Minimum saturation of heavy oil should be uh, 40%. Minimum oil content of reservoir should be 800 uh, barrel per uh, acre feet. So um, another thing, maximum reservoir depth should be 3,000 feet, around 1,000 meter again. So minimum reservoir thickness should be 30 feet, right? Some meters, you can see. All right. So, 
in this method, the steam drive, the environmental challenge, we can say some some uh, words regarding on the environmental challenge. Although actually the thermal UR methods have uh, many benefits regarding obtainable significant amounts of heavy oil recovery, there are some important issues and challenges required to deal with, especially for the methods that uh, employ steam and its generation by means of cost effective and clean burning fuels, easy access to water, energy intensity that contributes to life cycle, carbon dioxide emissions, uh, hydrogen sulfate, air pollution, uh, and finally, and finally, public consent, uh, which are important but not uh, unsurpassable problems. So, for instance, natural gas, which can be considered as a clean energy type for the burning purpose, causing a relatively smaller amount of carbon dioxide and partially fresh water, can usually be used for steam generation. Okay, but cleaner to that, Besides natural gas, renewables, renewables can be used as well. All right, solar energy can be used as well. We will discuss this one tomorrow. So, furthermore, the electricity in heavy oil fields and steam cogeneration can significantly contribute to the efficiency of the methods and decrease in carbon dioxide emissions. Okay, so these are. Uh, the things that we can say regarding on the steam drive and steam flooding uh, process. Okay, <clears throat> let me continue some uh, short uh, parts also I have to include. So, herein you can see the comparison of greenhouse gas emissions caused by steam driven EUR methods. Okay, so uh, here you can see the Canadian bitumen uh, SHGD uh, has been applied. Uh, so uh, California thermal, California thermal again, and conventional crude. So here we can say that actually uh, among among these challenges I mentioned previously, the carbon footprint caused by heavy oil recovery via thermal methods using steam is one of the most important ones to struggle with particularly due to steam generation in comparison with the other tra traditional recovery techniques. So consequently, greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions can change depending on the parameters such as the type of grid oil, recovery methods characteristics, and the steam generation dynamics based on the applicability. So here in the figure illustrates the comparison, as I mentioned, showing the average estimates of the emissions for different kinds of oil and bitumen. So, steam employing thermal EUR methods actually are projected as one of the most important methods in the future regarding on recovery by means of heating reservoirs. They can also be considered to have the huge potential to utilize as the methods with a feasible and lower amounts of carbon emissions. So, for example, these processes can be realized with the conversion of the available steam drive, steam drive systems to solar power systems, resulting in much less amount of carbon footprint and decrease in natural gas supply by blending to generate steam. All right. Okay. So, another one. The in situ combustion processes. Okay, another one. The in situ combustion processes. Uh, here, heavy oil and oil sand reservoirs constitute the bulk of the worldwide petroleum resources. Some of these resources, which are in shallow zones, can be produced by using mining methods. We mentioned earlier eh? that has what high CO2 emissions and creates some environmental problems. So it is also an expensive process, which could not be feasible for most of the projects as well. In deep reservoirs, which include most of the heavy oil and bitumen resources of the world, in situ recovery methods prefer to be applied. It's also old technology. So in situ combustion process is one of the main thermal recovery methods, you can say, that injects a gas phase, including oxygen, 
and mostly air, mostly air, and enables a reaction with the crude oil in the reservoir. So the aim of this process, the aim of this process is to form a combustion front, first of all, a narrow bank oxidation zone between uh, the, the, the temperatures between uh, 450 to uh, 550, 600 uh, centigrades, all right, by generating an internal heat. Okay, so the combustion bank, the combustion bank is sourced by a reaction of the crude and crude and the oxygen that it propagates through to the reservoir. So the process aims to increase the recovery percentage of oil phase, actually. So in situ combustion has been attracted oil industry's interest since the middle of uh, midst of the 20th century. So it's uh, old technology actually, with, with new techn technological development, but they're applying for decades, okay? So numerous studies and publication that includes uh, analytical as well as numerical uh, ideas, models to find the most effective way of usage uh, of this method has been performed, okay? So, According to the propagation direction of air phase and the combustion front, in situ combustion processes classified in three categories, such as uh, we call for forward combustion, uh, reverse combustion, and the high pressure air, in the, uh, air injection. Okay, so three different uh, processes included. Okay, in, in for example, uh, you can see the temperature behavior of typical forward combustion process, the first one I added in here. In forward combustion method, actually, the cases that the injection fluid includes uh, here only air or enriched air, okay, with oxygen up to 100%. So they called it as dry combustion as well. So if the injection here, if the injection fluid contains water phase in the air, it called wet combustion. In this type, the ignition starts near the injection well and just after the fluids are injected to the reservoir and injected fluids move forward to the same, di to the same direction of the combustion bank. So on the contrary, what we can see here uh, in, in uh, reverse combustion, the second one, in reverse combustion, the ignition starts near the production well and the bank and the bank moves in reverse direction to the air flow in the reservoir zone. So although it's successfully applied in the laboratory, field applications could not show the same performance till now due to the oxygen phase exhaustion before reaching to the production well. Okay. So applicable, applicable in the laboratory scale, but uh, field applications a little bit tricky. So, both forward and reverse combustion methods are preferred to be used in heavy oil reservoirs. Okay. <clears throat> another one, uh, this air injection, another uh, subtype of this one is the HPAI called high pressure air injection. So it can be considered as an effective IOR method that experienced in tight reservoirs that includes conventional light oil. Okay. So in this type, reservoir medium that has a low permeability prevents to inject any liquid effectively. So the best choice is to inject air that will generate some heat by low temperature oil oxidation, as well as it enables the pressure maintenance. So although the process can be applied in all types of reservoirs that includes oil that's mobile in the reservoir conditions. So it only being tested it only being tested in uh, several light oil reservoirs of the uh, United States. However, however, heavy oil uh, air injection, heavy oil air injection, another procedure, and the descriptions uh, has been given uh, has been given uh, have been given actually in uh, in the literature by many many uh, works, many studies. Uh, Ramona Gravis is one of them. Uh, their works uh, for Colorado School of Mines. Uh, her works uh, include this one. So due to the difficulties facing the field, field projects of reverse combustion and the HP AI, and the forward combustion methods have been most popular, widely used and investment attracted methods for the last 30 years. So uh, 
people, uh, specialists, are choosing these type of methods to be applied. So these methods are firstly investigated in the uh, Athabasca tar sand bitumen in, in, in Canada, I think, uh, for for a structure for a fluid with uh, for oil with uh, eight API and uh, 500,000 centipoise viscosity and 51% uh, in weight, uh, asphalting content including. So this type of uh, hard, hard uh, fluid, very hard fluid, uh, they applied and uh, they got a very, very good results with these ones. Uh, and it is, uh, it is actually compared with the, um, compared with in economical cases, compared with the SAGD process, for example, is much more economical and can be an alternative to these uh, thermal methods. Okay. So, some type of uh, this air injection uh, methodology, Thai is one of them, tool to heal air injection process. It can be described. It can be described as the air injection method as well, which aims to increase the productivity index of oil phase by increasing what the residual light oil recovery uh, with the process they call it LTO, right? So, the method is capable to integrate the efficiency with the horizontal well again. Again, the horizontal well. Firstly, uh, this uh, I, I, ISC process start to use in horizontal wells, actually. Uh, again, as I told you, um, Ms. Graves and their uh, team uh, experimental work about this one um, and uh, they inspired the development of this Thaya method actually. Uh, and uh, in, their, in their work, if one of their works in 1993, the method used a horizontal producer with a, with a vertical injection well that located at the top of the top section of the oil zone. So in a horizontal well, Thaya method uh, enables Actually, the mobilization fluid to enter the exposed session, ex exposed session uh, directly by operating in a gravity stabilized mirror. So the process is more focused on supplying the energy need to mobilize the oil phase, uh, thermal upgrade of the reservoir zone, as well as increasing the recovery. So it can be applied as primary method or a co-process that can assist another process to increase the thermal efficiency. Uh, during the Thai process, so in uh, some part of this can be seen in the picture actually, during the Thai process, different zones can be formed as burnt zone, like combustion front, coke zone, uh, mobile oil zone, and cold oil zone. Uh, some zones uh, differentiate to some uh, zones actually. So, according to the effects of the displacement, the processes can be described in two different categories such as long distance displacement and short distance displacement. The conventional forward combustion method is categorized in long displacement process and vaporized parts of the oil and water phases are condensed in the cooler parts of the reservoir and produced from the production well. So this condensation creates a less mobilized phase ahead of the combustion front. So in forward combustion technique, the aim is to leave the clean formation after the burning process. Here in the mobility of vaporized phase after it condensed has to be high enough to maintain the uh, process and the air injectivity. And the air injectivity. However, it's the main factor that cause uh, that cause a failure or poor performance in the field applications. So. Let me go. Uh, let me go through to the advantages of Thai. One of them, we can say that the horizontal production glass enables communication and connectivity, and no need for steam injection or heating uh, of the oil zone. Okay. So here, in, if you want to, okay, this this can be uh, harmful for the environment. We can say in the environmental phase, it can be harmful for the environment. So to prevent this, what you need to do. Uh, the, you have to make uh, the uh, projects which you need to heat your fluid much more profitable and uh, uh, cost-wise applicable. Okay, so if it may it becomes much more cost-wise applicable, so the project owners will not choose to use these methods 
you choose to use other methods that you have to that you use the renewable energies, all right? Like heating methods, all right? So another one is the fluid saturations maintained in the downstream of the combustion front. It enables higher productivity index in early times of the production and it affects the cash flow profile. It enables the control of gas phase uh, override effectively. Okay. It enables uh, reservoir zone oil viscosity to be lower and improve production rates with less separation costs. It enables a safe operation by processing in a narrow zone ahead of the combustion front and reduces. So it enables a high recovery up to 80% oil of uh, original oil, oil in place. Okay. It has more environmental benefits through recycling CO2 and has better performance in reduction of energy recovery compared to uh, steam acid gravity drainage. So it thermally upgrades the oil phase and enables easier transportation, both in upstream and downstream parts with less equipment costs like pumps, heat exchangers, whatever. Okay. So the last one, the last method, like Tai, I want to mention the Capri method. <clears throat> the Capri method. The Capri process can be considered as the catalytic version of Tai. Catalytic version of Tai. So it uses a layer of catalyst places placed in an annular position throughout the horizontal section of the production valve, well, and it enables the in situ upgrading during the process. The reaction of the thermal cracking in Tai process occurs in the mobile oil zone and the coke parts and it forms the initial reaction of Capri. So the mobile oil zone includes oil, combustion gases, water, can be steam, as well as, as steam actually, not can be steam, water phase, steam, right? So as well as few amounts of oxygen and carbon monoxide. So this fluid composition travels in downward direction and contacts with the catalyst around the producer well. Here in, the annular catalytic part enables a second run of firing on the hydrocarbon material that could not that could not be oxidized previously. Okay, so the combustion zone temperature is around 500 to 600 centigrade, like Tai, right? We talk in Tai, and the pressure is same with the reservoir pressure. The laboratory experiments show that the Tai and Capri processes are stable and robust processes without any oxygen breakthrough into the horizontal production well. And Capri process in Capri, uh, it enables to increase the API gravity around 5.3 degrees compared with the Tai. Okay, more than 5.3 degrees compared with the Tai, the API degree, it can increase. So, in the literature, most of the studies related to uh, in-situ combustion, Thai and Capri processes, are belong to experimental studies that it is a complex phenomenon to increase the experimental results to field conditions, actually. So although, uh, for example, one of the studies, uh, Islam et al., they investigated the scaling program, program for uh, in-situ combustion process experimentally and succeeded to scale most important groups uh, properly, the paper actually summarized that it's, it's not possible to scale all the requirements. Uh, for, for instance, the Thai needs extra detailed numerical modeling in all possible cases, scales to identify the physics of the process completely. Uh, so both Thai and Capri processes are applicable to a wide range of reservoir types, such as thin formations of low pressure, poor quality deep reservoirs, and heavy oil reservoirs. That's what we can say regarding all the uh, these three uh, processes. Okay, I added one more in here, CHOPS, called heavy oil production process. So I'm coming to the end. CHOPS is a process that enables a considerable amount of increase in, in productivity, okay, uh, up to 20 times compared with the conventional production methods, okay? So, uh, it's, it's, it, it can be applied uh, very well in, in uh, conditions that Darcy law flow equations are valid. Okay, 
So uh, this is one point that we can mention in this method. So mainly the method used to separate the sand from the oil for disposal without any sand removal tools such as liners, gravel packs, screens, uh, etc. All right. So the process is successfully applied in several places for many years. Again, uh, these problems can be seen in Venezuela, have oil problems, Kazakhstan, Canada and China. Uh, these are applied and there are uh, various studies, uh, research studies also in the literature you can find regarding on the CHOPS operation. So, okay. So, although the CHOPS applied wells uh, shows different production characteristics, typical behaviors include the uh, following factors that I will mention by time. Okay, what are these factors? Uh, following the completion of a new well, for example, a large sand influx up to 40% uh, volume of the produced liquids and solids can be observed. Okay, there's a study regarding on this. So in, in a few days to several months, a gradual decrease in the sand rate observed and as a function of oil viscosity, the behavior converts to a steady state influx rate. So in several months, firstly, the production rate of oil increased and reached to a maximum level and then slowly tends to decline due to the domination of the depletion effect start. So it's worth to point out that in here, uh, sand and oil production rates fluctuate chaotically in this method and show some noise which needs to calculate the mean value of each point of the actual data. So GR values show a consistency and can remain in the same levels for many years, okay? For many years, although the CHOPS process can be re-established by applying a successful work over operation, work over operation, and it is uh, hard to reach to the same levels as in the first cycle. So you, you will get the maximum uh, values, uh, recovery values in your first cycle, and then uh, it, uh, it's expected to be lowered by time. So operation in a very uh, heavy oil and bitumen reservoirs and by using chops uh, is cheaper method compared to other ER techniques. Uh, however, it's also it also has two main issues which need to be taken into account. Uh, these are it, it results in operation. It can be result in operational failure. One of them is a very low ultimate recovery than expected. Uh, need an ex extra UR method usage. Uh, a hybrid method can be uh, used uh, according to the suggestion. Renewable energy can be included in this section as well. So predict the wormhole growth mechanisms of the zones that chops apply. So this is much more technical, the wormholes. Uh, you have to uh, be very careful regarding on where you are injecting this one, okay? Uh, your fluid. Okay. So in overall, institute combustion process advantages I would like to mention. Uh, these can be used for both heavy and light crude oil reservoirs, we mentioned already. The process is based on the removal of heavy components of reservoir fluid, which prevents the crude oil production. Uh, removing these components in such a combustion process produ produce heat and flue gases uh, that are miscible in the oil phase. Therefore, in such a combustion methods includes miscible gas injection. Okay. A stable steam front is beneficial because it enables condensation of water phase in front of the steam and it makes easier to control the mobility in steam injection process. So in situ combustion processes can be applied in horizontal wells by using tie method we already mentioned. It clearly increases the productivity ratio compared with the conventional ones in horizontal well. The reaction of thermal cracking in Thai process occurs in the mobile oil zone and cockpits, and it forms the initial reaction of Capri. Both Thai and Capri processes are applicable to a wide range of reservoir types, such as steam formations, uh, low pressure, poor quality deep reservoirs, heavy oil reservoirs. So both processes are also beneficial in terms of separation and equipment costs. Okay, so chops is applied in a wide range of countries. Due to the it's due to its lower cost compared to other recovery methods, and in chops operation, sand production, sand favor, uh, foamy oil production, as well as the wormhole structure models 
are crucial and need to be described. So, these are the end of this information. With this information, I have to start, I have to stop the first day. Herein, we saw the application areas of oil and gas industry uh, that we can adapt the renewable energy. Uh, so tomorrow, we will continue with the in, uh, renewable energy uh, uh, types and the, the applications in the industry, oil and gas industry, and what can be the forecast, how it can go, where, what, what places it can go, okay? So we will make a kind of uh, future forecast uh, regarding on this, all right? So uh, with this information, uh, I have to stop uh, my uh, first day. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Thank Mr. Hakan, for your brief uh, presentation. And we really, we really appreciated the time that you spent with us today. And we hope that this was the time that uh, well spent for you too. And we think that all of the information that we got today will be very useful, very productive and informative for you, for us. And uh, if any question of the past months, directly ask to the Mr. Hakan sure. by Amit themselves. Sure, I am the, directly. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd love to answer your questions directly.